them with a, a little bit of an allegory. And I will jump over to Glenn. Why don't you uh, take it from here? We want to just talk about security incident response and kind yeah. of, you know, yeah, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so at, at the at the risk of being overly simplistic, um, uh, I thought I'd start the conversation by thinking about what we do from a security perspective, um, similar to you know the the old days with uh, castles or with walled cities, where um, the, you know you would build a wall around you and you're protecting yourself from some of your outside threats, right? Uh, and I think some of the questions that are on the screen uh, are sort of analogous to the way that a lot of people think about defenses today, right? So you may have to think about policy. So things like, you know, are the gates being locked at night or at regular intervals? And, you know, do we have certain screening processes about what's allowed in and out of our city, right? Um, you may have, um, uh, you know, maintenance uh, concerns, right? So uh, in the same way that uh, for security uh, company or for security for your company, you may be thinking about patch management. In a walled city, you might have to go around and make sure like, you know, are my walls and my towers sound? And do I need to, you know, apply some maintenance to them from time to time? Um, you may need to inventory your assets, right? Um, or, you know, some of your, um, your commodities and say like, look, do we have enough food and water if we're under siege or, you know, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, do we have the things we need to operate as a proper city? Um, and then, you know, there's certainly the future planning and thinking about the different security tools you have. Like in, in, in the walled city example, uh, that question might manifest itself as like, hey, do we have enough towers? Do we have right, enough gates? Do we need to build a moat, right? Do we need additional defenses? Um, so I think when you think about it, sort of physical security in this way, there's very simple uh, analogies to how we think about um, cyber. And, you know, uh, we, I want to start with this because, you know, I think it's important for us to remember these are all reasonable things that we all think about. We may do some things better than others. And oftentimes, um, besides just the, the mechanics of all this, there's, there's also a level of automation that we're going to be thinking about. And that automation may take the form, um, in this case, of like checklists or, you know, uh, delegating to other folks who help you gather this information and make sure it's being done properly. And you can, I think, see fairly uh, easily as we go through the conversation, there are ways that ServiceNow and Record Future can help you with all of that. Right. Um, the next slide introduces a slightly different take, which may be a little bit um, unfamiliar, um, but is, is also where a company like Record Future can help a lot. A lot. It's this idea of external threats, right? And looking beyond your walls to see where uh, you may have risks and how those risks might impact your, your planning and thinking. And so again, in the walled city analogy, um, you can see some of the questions that might uh, exist out there that are analogous to um, uh, external threats you should be aware of. You know, are someone, you know, is someone asking for the keys to my castle? Who has those keys, right? Did I make duplicates and, and hand it out to some of my trusted friends? Um, or, you know, is someone trying to sell my property? Like, are they pretending to be me and saying like, hey, come and buy my city or buy my castle? Um, you know, have, have some of my neighbors been attacked recently? And if so, how are they attacked? Um, uh, or, you know, are there blueprints out there that tell people what my defenses look like, right? So all of this information would be valuable for you if you're, you know, in this case, you know, the administrator of a city. Uh, and, and likewise, there are analogous things you might want to do if you are the administrator of your um, firms of uh, cybersecurity. And so with that, let me turn it back to, um, to Chris and Carl to talk about what the real world examples of, yeah. of this sort of thinking are. No, it's all good. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, that's uh, it's a great example. Just thinking about like, you know, some people may be at that city administrator level of thinking about what's going on in the city. Some people may be already be looking outside. And I think we just want to try to bring that into the real world and talk, you know, through, you know, what does that look like in ServiceNow when we start talking about SecOps? So Carl, let me hand it over to you. Just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where things are at with ServiceNow and SecOps right now. Thanks, Chris. So one of the big things when you think about what Glenn was walking through there is <clears throat> a lot of that conjures up just a handful of questions, but there's so many more, right? And that really plays into what we all face, which is I have so many threats, which ones are the ones that actually could be the true risk? Which ones are the ones that could actually impact my business, right? And that's really some of what we're gonna talk about how we can address today. And the other part of that is that volume, as we all know, gets stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger. We, you know, many of us on this call and those attending been around for a while. We've seen as things have gone from, you know, small volumes, thousands a day to millions of logs and et cetera. It just, it all adds up fast when we look at some of the stats out there of, you know, the thousands of attacks that everyone actually, uh, actually addresses every day and pushes off. It's kind of incredible when you think about that. So when you think about all those different questions, what Glenn was going through it, it tells you a real strong story on geez, you know, we have what we think are very strong walls, right? And the example uses a castle, which is fantastic, you know, 
but the reality is how strong is it and how easy is it for someone with the, the right equipment to get in? How easy is it for someone with the right knowledge to break through your perimeter, right? And, and that's what we have to be aware of. And one of the biggest things that, that we all need to, to stay focused on when we think about that and what we address a lot with what we'll talk about today with being able to automate some of that and, and have some of that vision, uh, so to speak, like uh, you heard Glenn touch on and, and Chris with that ability to have that threat intelligence and see what's going on. There's also that ability to go ahead and take that knowledge and geez, know where might they go next and what are they gonna be up to and how might they get into that castle, right? Um, because at the end of the day, how quickly we respond before it impacts our business is really the most important thing because we know we're all gonna be attacked. It happens every day. Welcome to, the, to today's world that way of cyber, right? So, so how do we kind of, you know, I put here, how do you stop that crazy cycle? It's like, don't get lost in that. Focus on, do we have the visibility to see what's going on? Are we prepared to respond quickly and timely before it impacts the business? If we are, then let's go forward and take it on. And we can do that. So if you want to go to the next, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, uh, Chris, uh, you know, I know you'll you'll dive in here more, but one of the great things you see right away is if you think about everything we touched on in the perimeter and et cetera, um, it all starts with some of that traditional approach, right? And here's what's gone on in the past. Uh, essentially, some some very core, uh, you know, data points that come in between SIM and network monitoring, compliance, et cetera. All of it tells a limited amount of a risk and security story. Uh, and then ties that to our users that go in, uh, and Chris and Glenn will leave you to chime in here, but um, this is that starting point, so to speak, hence the traditional approach. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you know, like you're saying, Carl, um, it, there are so many different tools and management consoles and things that, you know, people might traditionally be using to kind of, you know, carve up a piece of this puzzle. And, and you see, I mean, we're only scratching the surface even with some of these items that we're mentioning on the left, right? Because, you know, endpoint monitoring and, and any number of other tools that you could think of, there's all sorts of data out there in ways that we're trying to dice this up. What we're trying to look at with ServiceNow when we start saying, okay, how do we get out of that more traditional approach and what can ServiceNow bring to the picture? It's really kind of this, this funnel in the middle. We wanna be able to aggregate the, the events and things that are happening and the things that we really care about and wanna take action on from these other tools and then figure out like, okay, how are we gonna prioritize that stuff? How are we going to figure out, you know, yeah, what to do first? Um, how risky is it? And you know how can we use some of the data that ServiceNow knows, you know, to enable those things. So the the funnel here, you can kind of see it. Not only are we just taking data from those other things, but we're taking information that ServiceNow also knows via managing some of these other processes. So we can talk about the CMDB. We can talk about, you know, how do we know things about the users in our organization, or maybe users that we're serving outside the organization. Um, we can talk vulnerability data and things like that. When we talk about you know trying to figure out what to do next, um, a lot of that stuff can really be critical because if I know that I'm having an incident that relates to a specific server, for instance, that serves a critical business process, you know that's going to be much more important to me than maybe just a, a single end user device monitoring or you know things of that nature. I can start to prioritize things, and so leveraging that information that ServiceNow already knows about is really critical. It, and it's, it's also a, worth. Oh, yeah, go it's ahead, a good point. Pardon my interruption, because it's yeah, a great right. point you just made on, you know, leveraging that data is critical because when we look at all the different data points that come in and this aggregation and prioritization that goes on, it's not like we have too much information. You almost never can. Let's be candid, right? So the reality is how quickly can I surface up and get that data correlated properly so that it's aligning and telling me the information I need it to tell me, right? To let me know what are the bonus what are the most compelling priorities so I can get my teams on those? Or as we'll talk about further, automate some of those tasks right at hand, right? So the great thing to remember is this immediately gets more value out of the data you've already invested in. Yeah, absolutely. That's 100% true. I, th I think, um, you know, when you start talking about visibility and accountability as things come into service now, you know, maybe those things aren't like, you know, the really exciting words that we all want to talk about, but it's, you bring that stuff in and it's, it's not just that, okay, it's, it's visible now, but it's that service now gives us automation and orchestration capabilities that you can start to take those things and dice them up, you know, and that's a good transition, I think, into the next slide here, where we want to talk about, you know, I think it's something that like Glenn, I think alluded to where it's, it's really common that as you start to monitor all these things, and Carl, I think you mentioned this too, you know, 
the, the very first outcome that we see a lot of the times as you start to aggregate from a lot of these tools is, oh my goodness, I've got all these incidents, you know, and how do I start to take this and actually make it actionable, right? How do I prioritize what comes first? You know, we talked about the funnel, we talked about surface now, but you know, it, it, that's not so easy when you start getting swallowed by volumes of data. And, you know, the, the keys are really, you know, not just trying to, you know, see the forest through the trees, you know, we need to be able to focus on the things that are the most critical, right? So that's where we start to talk about, okay, can we really categorize these things? Can we say that we're seeing a high volume of phishing incidents and can we automate a response to that? You know, whether that's, you know, semi-automated at first, whether it's fully automatable for some of these things through the platform, that's great. But as much as we can automate our response to the things that we're seeing the most often, that we're spending the most man hours on, or the things that are the most risky to our organization, that's where you're going to start to see a lot of that value start to come out. Um, you know, as opposed to when you have all these things in these individual consoles, again, with like Glenn's, you know, analogy of, of the walled city, it's important to do all these other things really well. But just by doing these things well, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can actually have the manpower to do it efficiently too. You know, I, I think that the automation is really when we start to talk about how are we digging ourselves out of this hole and keeping up. I, I think that's one of the key points that we wanted to drive home here. That's why I told Glenn you need to dig a deeper moat. I was absolutely 100% <laughs> correct. So, but with that in mind, you, you tell a great story here, Chris, and Glenn, I won't steal any of your thunder on, you know, talking about some of the intelligence that goes in, but the reality is it, it's so true. In other words, being able to take all that volume, be careful what you ask for, because you're going to get it, right? But being able to if you take that and bucketize it according to where it, to where it goes, and then taking even further between our solutions, the fact that you can go ahead and then align what are like incidents so that you might have what appears to be a hundred phishing incidents. It might actually be three particular incidents and they're all aligned and correlated too. So that's what's kind of really great too, is you take not only those buckets, but you understand which ones are similar or maybe part of the same campaign, so to speak. Yeah, let me let me maybe add to what you just said, Carl. Is, you know, one of the advantages of having all of this in one platform is you know you you can mine it in the ways that you just described, right? Instead of having you know different systems look at this information and you know different groups um, not recognizing that patterns exist, um, uh, that's one of the benefits of a, of a platform like ServiceNow, right? You you can have you know your asset information, your user information, all your log information, all in one place, and so when uh, different parts of your system, parts of your security infrastructure get hit, um, the patterns start to emerge uh, because you're correlating all that data together. And then, you know, what may have looked like 10 different disparate events or 100 different events start to look like, oh, it's actually just a variance of two or three. And hey, now we've got some ways to, you know, automate a response or be much faster because we're recognizing that we've seen this before. Agreed, agreed. And then a patching, you could actually be batched. It's just a, a great opportunity by going down that road of understanding, geez, these 100 are actually part of three, right? right? To your point. So yeah, yeah, well said. Excellent. Yeah, and you know, we spent a little bit of time there talking about, you know, okay, how do we do these things on the platform? How do we look at kind of what's inside the walls? Bringing that, you know, uh, the analogy out into, you know, more of the real world, this is where we're sort of wanting to talk about, okay, you know, how do we get some of these signs into service now? How do we look at the warning signs of attacks? How do we look at, you know, malware signatures and how risky they are and what we're seeing kind of in our environment? Um, really, that's where a recorded future and vendors like recorded future threat intelligence vendors are going to be able to help you out a lot, you know, and, and we want to take this and, you know, out of the theoretical and start to, you know, bring it into the, the real world here. So I want to make sure that we kind of get ourselves to the demo and get to show you a little bit of what this is going to look like. And it's not just, you know, a bunch of colorful slideware, obviously, but, you know, this is really what we want to drive home, right, is that it's, it's great to do the things that are inside the wall really well. Uh, and different organizations are at, at different points with that, right? You, you may be having just the different management consoles. You may already have it aggregated inside ServiceNow. And you may be thinking about, okay, how do I start monitoring what's outside of the walls? That's really what we wanted to kind of get to here is, is talking about the value of looking at what's outside the walls. And then how do we take action on that? How can we automate those things in with ServiceNow? Or how can we get people aware of these things that are happening before they start to adversely affect your organization? So with that, jump in more into the practical, I want to give it uh, back to Carl for a little bit just to talk through, you know, when we talk security incident response and kind of what the process looks like, you know, you can sort of highlight, I think, a little bit more about where does automation fit into this process and where are the values of that? Thanks, Chris. 
we're, we're going to talk real quick because we want to get to the demo. It's very exciting. But if you think about everything we just discussed in the last 10 minutes, what it really boils down to is what used to be all these steps were essentially manual, right? And then some is the reality. Um, now, by being able to take a look at, okay, we understand that things are actually repeatable incidents. Things are all different areas like Glenn and I were touching on being able to align them and have those that are similar and confirm that they're part of the same campaign, et cetera, et cetera. All these things allow you to automate certain aspects of that workflow. And being able to automate aspects of that workflow means that instead of your teams and a dedicated person and a group of folks going through all this scenario, they actually just have to focus on the incidents themselves. <laughs> In other words, so much of that mundane that drains their time and being able to go ahead and you know have the prioritization alignment to the right person, sending emails, confirming all these different things that happen as part of the workflow and the process, the threat and tow lookups like Glenn was alluding to, all of that can actually be automated and a part of that workflow so that your teams and team members just focus on resolving that incident and making sure that it doesn't go any further than it should and impact the business, right? And that's the exciting part. So what used to take hours now becomes minutes. That's a really strong takeaway from this type of insight, this type of information, and doing some of those just initial automations of those tasks. And Chris, if you wanna throw us to the next one, unless you have, either of you have a comment there. But um, you know, from a, a C-level perspective and, and from speaking with managers, et cetera, one of the other things to understand too is, it has a value. I mean, when we're talking about taking hours to minutes and what that means to the impact to teams, this is we you know we have up here is just some commentary around. Look, third party actually does it, does the evaluation, speaks with different customers. You end up with a situation where this is just their average cost of breach savings because they've deployed automated solutions, because they've leveraged the solutions that we're discussing today between the threat intelligence and the automation capabilities. Um, so it's not just about being able to scale those teams, which Lord knows we, we all know is more critical than anything, but it also adds up to dollars and cents, right? Some real practicalities here. And, uh, you know, it also cuts to the punch quick, you know, like the, the comment here from Recorded Future and ServiceNow with the client. Um, these are all shining examples of what it means to enable your team to scale better, use that automation, use that intelligence. Chris? Yeah, thanks. All right, Carl. So yeah, uh, just in the interest of time here, I am going to jump across into our demo. And we really wanted to get a chance to, you know, make this hands-on a little bit and talk through, you know, what does this look like when we start to see it inside ServiceNow? Um, specifically, you know, we talked about, okay, you know, in the absence of that perspective of being able to look outside the walls, what does that look like? You know, when you first turn on security incident, you may see, let's, let's, you know, I've got an example security incident actually already pulled up here. Um, you may see something like this come in. Okay. You know, and, and, you know, it may be worded any number of ways from whichever tools you've got. Right. But I've got my suspicious communication noted with a specific IP address here. And I might, you know, in some systems already have that correlated to a CI that it was talking to. And I may know, okay, this application server, you know, it's, it's semi-critical to my business and, and, you know, the service uh, security, security incident uh, engine has spit out a risk score here of 55. You know, so it's kind of a, a middling risk. And I might look at that and, you know, be able to do some poking around. I may think, okay, I should handle this. But the thing that is kind of missing there is, okay, you know, what is that IP address and how critical is it? And, and how would I be able to get some of that information? And you can see with the recorded future integration on this, you know, and, and the access to that you know, vendor that's providing you information of what's out there in the world, you know, what's currently going on in the global ecosystem that way. What I can see is, is that I've got some threat lookup results here, first of all. So this observable, this IP address is actually very malicious currently. So even just as of, uh, what is that, two days ago, we had a lookup on this one and it's got a risk score of 99. Okay, well, I can look at some risk evidence here and I can start to see that there's actually a current CNC server running at that IP address. So if I see that talking to my network now, okay, I know that my risk has you know, exponentially increased here and this is something that I need to jump on right away. Um, you know, along those lines, if I take a look back at some security incidents, you can see that it's not just that, you know, I have tools that might feed things in. I can also do things proactively with recorded future and, and these tools because they may be able to look outside the walls and find things before the tools in my network and things inside of my network would warn me. So in that case, if you looked at an example of something like a typo squad situation, so let's say you've got, you know, your Facebook 
And uh, let me open this up so we can kind of take a peek at it. Uh, you know, maybe you're operating globally in, in different countries and you could get a warning ahead of time that says somebody just registered facebook.com in Taiwan. And, you know, you could start to understand, okay, well, is there a phishing attack? Is there a risk behind this, you know, typo squatting where somebody registered this domain? And this is all configurable through these types of tools, right? So recorded future, you can go in and define alert rules saying, okay, can I find common typos that might have occurred on my domains? So you can see that then, you know, recorded future is going to give you that same type of perspective. I can look at this and understand that, yeah, there is some malicious intent that's been going on. This, this was registered real recently on the 9th. And I can see that there's been phishing detects observed or phishing attacks observed elsewhere, you know, with this kind of information. So that's the types of things that you want to really be looking for when you're saying, okay, you know, what can a vendor really give me that's outside the walls? you know, can I get a perspective really quickly at, as these incidents are coming in and say, okay, you know, can I do something with this? Uh, and there's really, you know, no end to, you know, the information that you can get here. Um, on those IP address types things, you can even get some, you know, geolocation type data where it's coming from. You could drill across actually into Recorded Future and get all sorts of information to your heart's content about links to say like, where is this appearing elsewhere on the web? So those are the types of things I think that you really want to be looking out for. Uh, and again, I think, you know, rather than make this just a, a demo of recorded future, I kind of just want to stick to that, you know, more of the perspective of this is what you kind of want to make sure that you can do with this kind of information. Then also, we talked a lot about automation earlier, and I want to make sure to highlight, you know, here's some of the ways that we could enable automation. So obviously, you know, these things can be categorized as they're coming in. So a recorded future can identify these types of alerts and we can bring them in. But it's not just that we want to be able to do workflows and playbooks as responses to these incidents that we already know about. Um, another feature that's available with the recorded future integration is that we can bring all of these risky domains and risky IP addresses, risky malware signatures into the platform. And so what you can see is just an example, I'll flip over here to a report that we've currently run. So this is just saying like, okay, show me everything that's very recent, uh, you know, with a, with a risky domain name, right? And I can take all of these domains that have been identified as risky in the last several days, and maybe I could update my web filtering, or maybe there are other you know, actions that I could take. Maybe I could do a similar report against the recorded future data for IP addresses, and now I could automatically export this as a CSV or via whatever mechanism that would allow me to import it and create firewall rules that would start to block these malicious IP addresses that we're potentially seeing activity on. So I can be more proactive with this kind of data, right, because this is automatically coming in on a scheduled basis. Recorded Future has their intelligence. It's already doing that analysis outside the network, and you are just benefiting as the recipient of that information. So we can bring that into ServiceNow, and ServiceNow can be the driver that says, what do I do with it? Do I push this to my firewalls and so on? So I really wanted to make sure to highlight a lot of those use cases because I think that's where you, know, you as a common security operations customer can start to derive specific value from these things. So uh, Glenn or Carl, I don't know if you guys have any comments before I jump out of the instance. Otherwise, I can get us back on our presentation route. And I know we probably have a couple questions to wrap up to. We actually do already. So, awesome. um, so if we want to jump into questions, and thank you, Chris, that was great. Yeah. Uh, I'll take the first one, guys, and chime in. Sure. How's that sound? But um, absolutely. An anonymous attendee asks. Everyone talks about how automation is great but no one talks about how to do it. How hard is it to automate actions and service now? And are there playbooks that are available out of the box? So it's a great question, you're right. Um, part of automation is just figuring out where to start as you hint at, I believe, right? Which is, there are a lot of different places you can start and you could get lost in it. But the reality is that one of the best areas is just to go ahead and start with those workflows and cache management processes that you have, rudimentary as they may be or not, or advanced, fantastic, either way, but start there. And as far as how do you automate some of those actions? So ServiceNow and Security and Response, the, the source solution, it, it actually has an actions library. So you can literally pluck and play those and build out your workflows. And then those also are canned playbooks. So you can go ahead and use a playbooks library and start to build out. The idea behind all of those is to give you the old 80-20 rule, right? 80% uh, of what's in those will probably work very well for you. 
and then you have to go ahead and adjust slightly for your appropriate organization, right? But one of the things I wanted to really emphasize there is, I, I love how you asked the question, which is automate the actions. That actions library is a real great piece because you can use specific actions. In other words, you don't have to deploy an entire playbook, folks. You could actually just say, this is my workflow and these three actions that are part of my workflow, I wanna automate because my team gets buried in them, right? It might be things like Chris was showing earlier, which is going back and pulling you know, a new threat and tell report. It could be many different things that way that seem like real simple, but often tie up teams. The simplest of things, they can get lost waiting for that to come through. Just let those actions be automated, pull from that library and go. So, uh, so again, I encourage you start in those areas, look at what you have for processing and workflow line them many times right out of the box with some of the actions and playbooks that may be there. So Chris and Glenn, I'll, I'll stop for now, but want to get us started on that one. Yeah, no, I, I think that one's great. Uh, I think you answered it really well. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, so you want me to, so the next one is, and uh, Glenn or Chris, I'll leave you to it here, but what are the security and where are the security incidents coming from before getting into service now? And another great question. Sure. And I think, you know, if we even step back a little bit in, t in time with the other depiction of the funnel, you know, we can have security incidents coming from any number of places. You know, they can be manually created by the team as somebody identifies something or they can be automated. Um, you know, automation is, is great where it saves us time, obviously. And, you know, we can have a lot of uh, different tools. So you might have tools that are monitoring for malware on your, you know, end user devices and then raising alerts in certain situations. Uh, we went over some use cases there where a recorded future might actually be, you know, identifying something off your network and then through a web services integration could be sending things into service now. So it's a lot of, you know, technology behind the scenes, but uh, generally, yeah, we're looking at trying to build these integrations so that we can bring them in from these other systems that are identifying it and then assigning those and using the rules to get them into the right teams or to automate our responses. So. Perfect. Glenn, how does yeah, the future know an IP or domain is risky or malicious? Yeah, that's a great question. And it goes into the core of what we do as a company. Um, we, you know, we're collecting information from over 800,000 different sources and that number is changing all the time. But um, you know, this idea of looking beyond your walls, well, well we automate that uh, at scale for our clients. And we, uh, as a SaaS business, we make that information then available to all of our clients. So, you know, we are looking at, um, you know, some technical information. We're looking at, um, uh, you know, registrations. We're looking at code repos. We're looking at chatter on dark web. Um, there's a lot of different places where there may be, uh, you know, nuggets of information that will indicate if something is risky. And that risk may be because, you know, um, uh, malware is being set up uh, to be delivered from there. Uh, it could be communication that we're seeing where we've identified that it's, um, you know, got patterns and um, signatures that are related to um, uh, C2 servers. Um, it could be, you know, typo squatted uh, domain registrations. You know, there's a host of different information uh, that exists and uh, we're connecting the dots. And uh, we've developed over time a number of uh, both sort of machine learned as well as heuristic um, uh, rules that uh, indicate when risk comes in. And then we, um, we calculate these scores in real time and present that to our clients. Um, the, the thing that we do with our scores, which I think is fairly unique in the industry, is that we, we in addition to a score, we tell you why it's risky. And it, you know, we'll list sources, we'll say like based on this source, it had this kind of mention, which leads us to believe this is used in this sort of way. And hence that kind of use or that kind of um, uh, malware has this associated risk. So um, it's, it's part of the secret sauce in terms of how we collect and analyze, but then we tra uh, transparently provide that information to clients so they have the visibility into why something is risky and how recent that information is. Glenn, that's a, that's a great point to make. And you know, Chris did a, a quick snapshot showing how you could drill in three quarter future right through uh, the ServiceNow dashboard, right? And that's the type of information you can truly get understanding for exactly why this is indicated as potentially malicious and highly risky and et cetera. Um, yeah. And Chris did that in like a split second. So something to think about, right? Right, right. And it goes into that whole piece of automation in a way, right? You know, it's automation is, is uh, it's time savings, right? At some level, it's also codifying your approach to certain things, right? Rather than, you know, two different researchers doing things differently. 
um, if you could give them the tools that allowed them to get access to the same information and have that information presented in a way that's super easy and um, does a lot of steps, like why wouldn't you do that? Uh, and so that's part of the value prop of uh, something like Recorder Teacher. Yeah, I love it. Well said. All right, those are the questions we have so far. Anyone else, thoughts, comments? Um, we're happy to go ahead and, and answer what we can. If we can't answer it, we promise to reach back to you and, and we'll we'll track that down. Yeah, as we close out here too, I mean, we'll give some contact info so that uh, if anybody does want to reach out, you know, I don't know if people are, you know, shy with the chat panel or if you just think of something later, um, we'll definitely give you guys some avenues to to reach out to us. Uh, did want to mention as we close out here that, uh, like we said at the beginning, we do have uh, episode three of our uh, webinar series coming up about vendor risk management, and we'll talk a little bit about you know some best practices there, and you know where you guys could derive value by again, you know, taking some information from outside the walls and starting to look at you know um, what's the security posture of our vendors and how can we assess that you know externally uh, so yeah. we'll have some information about that there uh, i know there'll be a registration link for that webinar session getting into the chat i believe here and hopefully that'll get you guys over to get registered um, and then if we can just click over once um, i got my contact info here uh, if you guys do think of any questions after the session's done here and want to reach out uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions or get you guys in touch uh, with glenn or carl or anybody who could you know help you guys out so definitely appreciate everybody's attention uh and i guess carl glenn any closing thoughts or any other questions that have flown in here none so far but um again i i hope these this series is helpful and particularly today I wanted to remind everyone that you know one of the comments you're glenn and crystal and i all make is start somewhere in automation right pick those areas that you can go in just to to have those uh those small wins to get rolling is a great thing to do um so i uh, would encourage you to do so if you're not already but uh, other than that thank you as always for your, your time and thoughts folks yeah thanks chris for leading a great conversation and uh, it's always a pleasure to spend time with the two of you uh <laughs> speaking about these things that we think about every day so absolutely fun, thank then. you so thank much you everyone great discussion the recording of uh, this uh, meeting of this uh, webcast will be uh, shared with you by email so stay tuned for that great bye everyone. Take care all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.